Hi, I'm Albert Huang, and this is Spatial Computing Part 3. In this video, we're going to explore the home theater system from the perspective of spatial computing. Instead of experiencing stories on a screen, what happens if you get to experience them in the space around your body? What will it look like? How will you interact with it? And how will these interactions shape your experience? Now, today's home theater system isn't like this at all. Today's home theater system is based on a screen, which is a perfect form of engagement if you just want to sit back, relax, and be entertained. But you can't really get physically involved with it, right? Like standing up and moving around the screen or putting your hands on the screen doesn't really do much. But with spatial computing, you can choose. You can either sit back, relax, and be entertained, or if you want to, you can get up. You can move around the environment and see the world from different perspectives. Now, before I really dig into the specifics of spatial computing with the home theater system, I just want to make a quick disclaimer. What you're watching here was built with 3D modeling software and clever video editing. This is just a design sketch. The point of these videos is to imagine what the future may hold. And hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll see that the future of the home theater system will provide a robust set of rich experiences that will overturn the way we think of and engage with home theater. So why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at what the home theater system with spatial computing has to offer. We'll start here with my spatial computing home theater collection. This is a collection of all the stories that I get to choose from. Now you can think of a story as a digital play or a TV show or movie that happens in the space around your body. Interacting with these things is pretty easy. Now one of the nice things about spatial computing is that almost everything you interact with is just a 3D object. That means whether it's interacting with a story or interacting with a piece of furniture, all you need to know is one set of gestures to interact with practically everything. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to interact with these stories using the gestures we talked about in Spatial Computing Part 2. The first task is to figure out which one of these stories we want to watch. Figuring this out is pretty easy. All you got to do is point to it. This will pull up all the meta information okay, and it will also show you a short preview of what the scene will look like. To select a scene, you can just click on it. This will place the story in my living room automatically. If you want to place it in a more specific spot, you can always click and drag to place it there. Now you should be able to tell already that this is a very different experience than watching something on a TV screen. This inhabits the real 3D space of my living room. So, like a statue or a diorama, I can always get a different perspective on it by simply walking around it and seeing it from different angles. Of course, because it's a 3D object, I can also get a different perspective on it by moving it around instead with my hands. Doing this is pretty straightforward. You can move it laterally by pointing, clicking, and dragging. This will go far distances really quickly. Or, to be more precise, you can pinch and drag. If you want to rotate the scene, you can pinch with two hands and drag in a circular motion. And to scale the scene, pinch with two hands and drag in and out. Now, I didn't cover this gesture in Spatial Computing Part 2 because when you're interacting with furniture, it's important to see it at actual size. But when it comes to most other 3D objects, like this story for example, it's useful to be able to see it at a variety of different sizes. When it's small like this, it's this really easy thing to watch. All I gotta do is sit back, relax, and sort of let everything happen without me. But when it's large, well, it's a totally different experience. Take a look. It's like I've been magically transported to a new environment. I can walk around in this environment and experience it from a more natural first-person perspective. Now, one thing to note is that when this story is so large, parts of it protrude beyond the walls of the room that I'm standing in, right? Like that tree, for example, no longer exists in this room. So the spatial computing system handles this quite nicely. It makes the wall look like it's made out of glass. Now, I can do this quite easily, actually. By doing calculations based on where my eyes are located, the shape and orientation of the room, and the location and orientation of the scene, it can determine whether or not there is a wall between me and what I'm looking at. If there is a wall there, it'll make the wall look like it's made out of glass by augmenting my vision through this set of goggles. Now here, the scene is large in a variety of directions, so it makes the walls, in a number of directions, look like they're made out of glass. It sort of feels like I'm standing in an aquarium where I can see beyond the walls, even though I can't really go out there. 
Now, that's something that's really important to note. Just like in an aquarium, you're still physically bound to the physical space of your room. You can't walk through walls all of a sudden, right? So to remind you of where these walls are located, the edges of the walls and corners are always visible. Additionally, if any part of your body gets close to a wall, it will react to remind you not to bump into it. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, if you can't go outside of this wall space, how do you interact with it, right? How do you, like, walk over that tree, for example? Well, although you can't walk over that tree because you'd bump into a wall before you got there, you can always move that tree over here, like this. Now, remember, although stories are 3D environments, they're still just objects, which means that you can use your spatial computing gestures to interact with them, right? So, if you want to move long distances, you point, drag. To move short distances, you pinch and drag. To rotate the scene, you pinch with two hands and rotate in a circular motion. And you can always scale it by pinching with two hands and dragging in and out. Now all this dynamic navigation stuff is really nice because it gives you the ability to move the scene around your body to give you the perspective that you need. And all this stuff is really great, but it's still sort of not quite there, right? The most important part about all of this is that we need something really interesting to watch. And although you can navigate around this environment, the environment's not interesting if nothing changes. So to get the most out of this experience, we're going to need to know some way to manipulate time and noise. Doing these things is pretty easy. To manipulate time, tap on where your wristwatch would be. From here, I can play, pause, toggle forward, toggle backward, fast forward, and rewind. Now, manipulating audio is just as easy. Pinch by your ear and raise and lower your hand to raise and lower the volume. To unplug yourself from the audio, pinch by your ear and pull, and then you can also plug yourself back in by doing the opposite. Now, pausing a three-dimensional story is a much more useful tool than pausing a two-dimensional video. When you pause a video, you pretty much just get a photograph. You might be able to notice something you didn't notice before, but you can't really engage with it, and you can't, like, look at different angles. But with a three-dimensional world, when you pause it, you're effectively freezing the world, right? You can always scale it to see different angles, you can walk around it, and you can use your time controls to do some pretty cool things. Pretty cool, right? So, now that we understand the basics of how to control all this stuff, I'm going to show you a few specific examples of where this technology might be most useful. I'm going to start here with uh, this football game. Now, a football game is a four hour long endeavor, and you probably don't want to be standing up, walking around, waving your hands around all day long, right? I mean, you want to just sit back, relax, and eat a bowl of nachos. So this perspective is really great because it gives me the ability to just see everything as it plays out in the floor of my living room. And uh, if I want to be more engaged, if I want to get physically involved, I can do that too. You see, from this perspective, I get a good understanding of what it feels like to be on the field. I can see what the quarterback is seeing just by standing next to him. And I get a really good sense of what it feels like to be in his shoes. I mean, those dudes are probably like 300 pounds and they're doing whatever they can to tackle this guy. It's a lot easier to appreciate sports when you can see it at full scale like this. Another really great thing that spatial computing has to offer for watching sports is that you get to control your perspective. So instead of waiting for somebody to give you the camera angle you want, you can go ahead and find it yourself. So if there's ever a questionable play, we can move the world to wherever we want to go to get whatever perspective we need. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So why don't we take a look at another example?
Now another thing this technology is useful for is watching long form stories. So imagine if instead of watching a movie on a screen, you could watch something unfold in the space of your living room. Now one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the stuff going on in Hollywood is already 3D computer generated graphics. That means if they incorporated that technology with spatial computing, you'd be able to see all that stuff happen in the space around your body. So here is a model of the scorpion from Transformers 3, and I'm not even going to pretend to know how to animate this thing, but I just wanted to present it as an example of what might be possible. I mean, you could watch that crazy epic scene happen in the space of your living room, or you could, you know, see it from a variety of different angles, or uh, you could scale it up and, and see it as a first-person perspective, right? Now, this technology obviously isn't just limited to crazy Hollywood blockbusters. You could use it for a wide variety of media. You know, whether that be news shows or sitcoms or romantic comedies or like educational programming or whatever. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you was uh, this scene. Uh, this technology would be really great for abstract audio-visual content. Now, I'm obviously not a professional VJ or anything, but uh, I did want to whip something up to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about here. Now, imagine how much cooler all of this would be if you got a team of like 20 really crazy creative people from interior designers to theater people, musicians and architects, all of them working to collaborate to make crazy music videos, but you know, in the space around your body. And that's really what all this home theater system with spatial computing is all about, right? To provide a way for us to experience things either in front of us in real 3D space or around our bodies in real 3D space. And also, you saw we can use our hands to move around and experience these things from a variety of different angles and to experience broadcast media in ways we've never been able to do so before. So thanks for watching. That pretty much sums it up. Uh, I wanted to give out a special thanks to the Blender community, uh, for the Google Warehouse community, and for Madden 2011, uh, all of whom, by the way, I'm not affiliated with at all. And uh, a very special thanks goes out to all the people from Kickstarter. Thank you so much for helping. This project wouldn't have been able to go on without you. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.